Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, I finished my PhD on the basis of a Flinders University scholarship, uh, for which I remain always grateful, and that is why when called upon, I try my best to come. Uh, my presentation is a very low-tech one, uh, so I just give a summary of a paper I just finished. And uh, to compensate for the low-tech element, if you are interested, um, you, you can easily get a copy from the center. Uh, so if you, you want, you contact the center and you can get a copy. Um, my paper intends to study China's policy towards BRICS and examine the uh, elements of realism, liberalism, co-institutionalism, and constructivism in, in this approach so as to better understand how Chinese leaders perceive China's role in the international system and how it seeks to articulate its interests and enhance its influence. The realist perspective initially has uh, certain traditional Marxist-Leninist elements in it. Around about uh, uh, 1977 or so, Deng Xiaoping, who was in power at that time, already suggested that the world can secure the delay of the outbreak of a world war. The, the, the idea of a world war, of course, is very significant in the Leninist analysis of global contradictions. And uh, on this basis, uh, around about 79, Chinese leaders began to launch its economic reform program, opening to the external world. And of course, China would like to maintain uh, a peaceful international environment to concentrate on the modernization program. And uh, round about 82, 83, China uh, moved a little bit to the, uh, uh, away from the pseudo alliance it enjoyed with the United States and Japan at the end of the uh, 70s, early 80s, and began to pursue what they called an independent foreign policy line of peace. It has maintained more or less uh, this kind of foreign policy line till now. At the end of the Cold War, the Chinese leadership's conception of the international power configuration uh, is very much a kind of one superpower and several major powers. Uh, there is, of course, of course, all the time a concern about uh, American hegemony and power politics, and uh, China continues to resent this unilateralism on the part of the United States, and naturally is very interested to promote multilateralism. Um, Chinese leaders, and as reflected in the Chinese mainstream media, uh, they tend to consider that the recent global financial crisis has pushed the BRICS group to the center of the international stage and it is expected to assume an important role in international governance mechanisms uh, like the G20 alongside the leading developed countries. Together with other developing countries, this group will have an increasingly important role to play in international affairs. Chinese foreign policy experts consider that while the United States remains the uh, sole superpower, the number of major powers certainly has been rising to the extent which facilitates the promotion of multilateralism and multipolarity. At the same time, the uh, emerging economies occupy a more central role in the international stage as they are eager to share power and responsibility China certainly would like to, uh, to achieve its peaceful rise through these processes rather than directly confronting the United States and the other leading developed countries. So China certainly wants to play down the idea of a, of a rising power, challenging the existing hegemony along the lines of uh, uh, John Mishima's book, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. To some extent, Russia is certainly interested 
in returning to the center of the world stage, and increasingly we see this tendency on the part of India and so on. Uh, in my paper, I do analyze a lot of uh, bilateral uh, disputes between China and Russia, China and India, and so on. On the whole, what we see is that you see more common global interests among the uh, BRICS group of countries rather than uh, strong sets of bilateral uh, common interests between them. And uh, this is especially so uh, in the case of Sino-Russian relations and especially Sino-Indian relations. In terms of trade, certainly you see that uh, after the uh, global financial crisis uh, starting in 2008, China's trade with the various groups, various countries within the BRICS groups uh, has been increasing rather rapidly, while the uh, trade between China and the United States, China and the EU has been growing only uh, at a very uh, uh, slow rate. On the part of the uh, liberal institutional perspective, more or less since 74, that is immediately after the uh, oil crisis, um, China has been articulating for the establishment of a new international economic order and uh, subsequently a new political order as well. Uh, and since the, inter the international financial crisis in the autumn of 2008, Chinese leaders have come up with a more integrated approach regarding building the new international order based on previously articulated themes. Uh, Chinese leaders and their foreign policy think tanks now consider that the international system and its institutions are inadequate in maintaining the international order. And therefore, uh, they believe that international NGOs, uh, too, uh, can assume a very important role in agenda setting and spreading norms. There is a little bit of contradiction here. Uh, you know that the Chinese authorities actually have very little tolerance for genuinely independent NGOs within the country. But now, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the international scene, uh, Chinese leaders are ready to assign a more important role to international NGOs. Um, Chinese foreign policy scholars tend to argue that the inadequacies of existing international institutions and the reforms have made international governance an important aspect of politics among major powers. That is to say, you expect a lot of competition and cooperation in international governance institutions uh, among them. Uh, in the post-Cold War era, wars among major powers or high politics have become much less likely. Instead, transnational challenges or non-traditional security issues have become more significant. At the same time, you have a lot of contradictions, conflicts among major powers too. Chinese foreign policy think tanks argue that the BRICS group intends to maintain and reform the existing international order and that it has no desire to destroy it. Chinese authorities consider the G20 and its new role a very meaningful development in international governance mechanisms and the priority accorded to the BRICS is actually very closely uh, 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 related to this. Um, in my paper, I do trace the uh, development of various meetings, mechanisms among BRICS countries and the emergence of the, the G20. Uh, and, and you can see that they have been in very uh, close steps. Um, two more minutes. Okay. Uh, I, take, I, I then jump to the 
constructivist uh, perspective, certainly Chinese leaders need to develop a, a discourse to, in support of the kind of arguments made, and uh, you can certainly find this discourse in various joint statements released after BRICS summits. And at the same time, in recent years, Chinese uh, official publications, main, mainstream media, have turned to the traditional Confucian idea of Wang Dao or the, uh, the uh, harmonious way to, to soften the impact of China's rise. Uh, these uh, uh, publications tend to argue that China would like to uh, 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 rely on a certain moral order in order to support its, its rise. What I would like to, to, say, to develop in my paper is that you can see certain elements of realism, liberalism, and constructivism in China's approach uh, towards the BRICS group. You may also find these elements in various segments of Chinese foreign policy, including China's approach to ASEAN and so on. Of the, although these elements may in varying uh, proportions, despite the rising tension between, say, China and the Philippines, Vietnam, over the South China Sea dispute, you still see, for example, uh, attempts to build some sub-regional organizations around the, uh, uh, the Greater Mekong Basin, uh, economic development organizations, the, uh, the People Bay, that is to say, the various development corridors between China and Vietnam, and so on. China's experiences in the development of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is interesting in the sense that uh, this, this is actually the first initiative on the part of China to build a regional organization. And uh, China has certainly developed uh, a new approach in, in, in building up various meetings, mechanisms, and so on. And at the same time, China has demonstrated uh, considerable deference to Russian interests in order to maintain a reasonable, reasonably influential role within this organization for China itself. Um, China's participation in international governance certainly has its benefits and costs, and there are some debates within the Chinese academic community whether, the, whether this high level of participation is in accord with China's interests. There is also uh, elements of contradiction here, too, in terms of the domestic and international linkages. I certainly uh, uh, just raised the idea of NGO just now. The uh, democratization process, of course, is another. While China all the time argues for demo democracy or democratization in, the, in, in international relations, certainly we don't see much progress within China itself. And the perception of the China threat has a lot to do with uh, the lack of uh, democracy in China. And you also see uh, the approach towards uh, India on the part of uh, uh, the United States as well in, in order to contain China. So um, because of the limitations of time, I shall stop here and I'd be quite, quite happy to engage in a dialogue whether formally <laughs> uh, in a few minutes afterwards or, or during tea time and lunch hour. Thank you very much.